Hello everyone, welcome back. I am Fer and this is the oldest customer complaint. It was written by Nani against Ea Nasir. In this tablet, Nani describes how she or he bought copper lingots from Ea Nasir, but when they sent their employee Gimil Sin to collect this merchandise, the copper lingots were of terrible quality. Maybe you already knew about the oldest customer complaint, and if you didn't, trust me, you will see it many times in the future, because this story gets posted every few weeks everywhere in the internet, and with good reason. It's very funny to read just how angry Nanny was, and it's even funnier when you find out that this is not the only tablet complaining about Ea Nasir specifically. <laughs> Apparently, Ea Nasir was a pretty bad merchant. The weird thing is that you and I can read customer complaints just like this one written just yesterday, but that would be super boring. Nobody wants to do that. What makes this complaint so interesting is the fact that it is nearly 4,000 years old. There's something really endearing and touching about finding out that people who lived so long ago were just like us, that they had the same problems that we do, that they had the same feelings, the same thoughts, that they had the same kind of soul we do. For this reason, I want to make a series of videos talking about texts just like this one. Texts that are not about important or powerful people from the past, but rather about just regular people people living their normal lives, just like we do. There are so many more examples to choose from, so at the end of the video, I'm gonna put a list and with some of them, and you can look at them and you can tell me in the comments which one you want me to cover next, or if you know of some other similar texts, you can also suggest them in the comments. But today, for the first episode of Ordinary Ancient People, we are going to cover the letters of Hekanach. The letters of Hekanacht were written sometime around the ancient times of 1963, before Christ, so around 3000 years ago. The author of these letters was an Egyptian man named Hekanacht, who was living in a big city, probably Thebes, and he was sending these letters to his family who were living in a small town called Nebsit, which was probably near Memphis. The great thing about these letters is just how much they can tell us about the lives of the people in this family. We know that Hekanacht had recently remarried and that his family didn't like his new wife. We know that they were struggling economically just a little. We know they had a clear understanding of how prices go up and down in a free market and they use that to their advantage. We even know that Hekanacht was probably spoiling his youngest son, named Snefru. But before we delve into all of that and more, first we have to understand why these letters are special in the first place, because presumably ancient Egyptians were writing each other letters all the time. So why would these ones be so important? Well, because we have them. Texts written by common people almost never survive. The main reason is that for most of history, if you wanted more copies of a text, they had to be made by hand. And no one would bother to make copies of the personal letters of a farmer, right? That meant that there would only exist one copy, and if this one copy was lost or destroyed, then that was it. This means that while people in ancient Egypt were certainly sending each other letters regularly, these ones are the only letters we have from that period of time, or at least the only letters not written by kings or powerful aristocrats. We have nothing nothing comparable from the centuries before, and the only other comparable document, the Wilbur Papyrus, was written 600 years later. The only reason these letters survived at all is because they became trash, <laughs> for real. Apparently, they were building a tomb for a guy named Messé, and they needed to make a ramp to push his coffin to its resting place. To make this ramp, they used a bunch of trash they had lying around, and for some reason, the letters of Hekanacht were in this trash. 
then they sealed the tomb and those letters stay there undisturbed for nearly 3,000 years until they were discovered in 1921, after Christ. Enough context, let's talk about the people. The letters mention several people and we can infer a lot about the relationships with Hekanacht. But first, let's talk about Hekanacht himself. Hekanacht introduces himself as a Ka servant, which means that he was some kind of priest, but we are not exactly sure what god he served or how high-ranking he was. But the point is that being a priest back then was like be having a college degree today. It means that he had a good education and he was able to get a decent job working at a temple in the city. Actually, that's why he was living in Thebes while his family was living in Nebsit. We also know that he actually got vacations from his job because he mentions in one letter that he's going to visit them in the summer and help them at the farm. So he spent his vacations working at his second job. Yeah. Um, there's actually a lot more to say about Hekanacht and the society in which he grew up, but I'm going to leave that for the end of the video. Ipi is the mother of Hekanacht. He doesn't have a lot of greetings for other people in the letters, but to his mother he says, greetings to my mother, a thousand times, a million times. He also says to her not to worry, that he is healthy and alive, which means that mothers have not changed at all since ancient Egypt. It's not clear who Hetepet was, but it's clear that she was important. Some archaeologists suspect that she might have been a aunt or a cousin of Hekanacht, but she shares a middle name with Hekanacht's second wife, so maybe she was the mother of his second wife? I don't know, it's, it's hard to be sure. Then we have Nacht. The letters mention that Nacht is the son of Ipi, which would make him the brother of Hekanacht. In the letters, Hekanacht asks his brother to go to a nearby town to collect some money that he's owed. Merisu is not a relative of Hekanacht. He is an employee at the farm, but he's a very important one. In fact, the letters are addressed to Merisu, and they consist mostly of instructions for him about the things that he should do around the farm. Even when Hekanacht has messages for his mother or his brother, he tells Merisu to give them the messages, maybe by reading that part of the letter aloud to them. In modern terms, we could say that Merisu was like a regional manager. He was keeping the business working while the boss was away. Oddly enough, sometimes Hekanacht seems to trust Merisu a lot because of everything I've mentioned earlier, but other times he reminds Merisu not to steal from him and to cultivate the fields, which makes it sound like Hekanacht didn't really trust him that much. So, yeah, it's not really clear what's going on there. It's, it's confusing. Next, we have Sihathor. Sihathor has a name that sounds like the villain of a fantasy movie or something, and he's mentioned exactly twice in the letters. The first time it says, the day Sihathor reaches you with this letter, and the second time is just listing his salary. From this, we can deduce that he was probably another employee of the farm, and that he was tasked with sending messages and maybe also writing them. Anupu was either the youngest brother or the oldest son of Hekanacht. Either way, Hekanacht clearly loves him a lot, as we will see in a bit. Also, Anupu seems to be the one in charge of taking care of the oxen in the farm. Then we have Znefru. Znefru was either the youngest brother of Hekanacht or his youngest son. And Hekanacht loves Anupu and Znefru a lot. At some point he says to Merisu, remember that you live by them and you die by them. Which in modern speech would be something like, remember that if something happens to Anupu or Znefru, I'm gonna kill you. Hekanacht was also spoiling Znefru. He mentions that he tried to take Znefru to the city with him, presumably to learn to be a priest, but Znefru didn't want to. Then Merisu apparently tried to take Znefru to the fields, presumably to teach him how to be a farmer, but he didn't want to do that either. Apparently, all Znefru wanted to do was to follow the oxen, which makes me think that he wanted to be with Anupu. 
Anyway, the point is that Hekanacht tells Merisu to let Snefru do whatever he wants, which sounds sweet, but it also sounds a little bit problematic. Um, I hope that Snefru didn't grow up being spoiled and that he ended up being a good person. Hopefully. Yutenhev is the second wife of Hekanacht. Some people think that maybe Hekanacht had two wives at the same time, which was weird but not unheard of in ancient Egypt. But he never mentions any other wife in the letters, which makes me think that maybe his first wife died and that's why he now has a second wife. Anyway, the point is that Yutenhev wasn't apparently welcomed in the family, as we will see in a bit. Nofret seems to be a young woman and a relative of Hekanacht. Most historians think that she was his daughter. Herunefer is not part of the family, nor an employee of the farm. Instead, he seems to be some kind of high-ranking government official. Perhaps he was like the mayor of a town. But I think he was also a friend of Hekanacht. In one of the letters, Hekanacht tells his brother to go rent some land to cultivate and to rent this land from a man called How the Younger. But that if he has rented all of his land, they should go with Herunefer. Another letter is specifically addressed to Herunefer. In this letter, Hekanacht is explaining that his brother is going to take some merchandise to a warehouse that Herunefer has. But what I found really interesting is that he's not asking permission and there isn't any mention of payment for using the warehouse. He takes it as granted that he can use it for free. Which makes me think that maybe Herunefer and Hekenacht were friends. Finally, we have Senen. Senen was fired. Apparently, she was another employee of the farm, but she did something really bad to Yutenhev, the second wife of Hekanacht. We don't know what she did, but Hekanacht is really, really angry, and he says that he won't allow anyone to insult his wife. He even complains with Merisu for allowing it, whatever it was. So he says that Senen is fired, and she can only stay one more day in the farm after the day they received the letter, and then she has to go away. Along with the letters, there were a few lists where it seems that Hekanacht was keeping a record of everything that his land was producing. Based on this list, it seems that they have a couple of very good years, but it also seems that the recent years were not so good. The first letter contains most instructions about cultivating, collecting some debts, but he also mentions twice that this is not a year for a man to defy his master. It sounds to me like he's saying to Merisu something like, hey man, we are in this together. Trust me, this is not a time for us to argue. The second letter is more explicit. After greeting his mother, he says, behold, the whole of Egypt has died, but you have not hungered. He is obviously exaggerating, but his point is that while a lot of people are struggling with the bad crops, he has made sure that everyone in his household is well provided for. Next comes the list of salaries. Hekanacht explains that the salaries have to change along with the river. So since the harvest have not been very good, he has to lower the salaries. Something very interesting is that he doesn't see a difference between the salary that he pays to his employees and the allowance he gives to his mother and his children. This tells us a lot about how he thinks, but it also tells us a lot about how we think, don't you think? It seems that he lowered everyone's salaries by about 25%, and he knew he, they wouldn't like it, but he came prepared. He says to them that half a life is better than a complete death, which I think means something like, hey, I know this sucks, but at least we are alive. And he also says to them that real hunger is when you eat people. Meaning something like, and I don't even want to hear you complaining that you are hungry unless you are resorting to cannibalism. We do not know what happened later with them. But what we do know is that this was a time of prosperity for Egypt, so they were probably fine. But there is one more very important thing we learned from these letters the creation of the middle class. 
For most of history, people were either rich, disgustingly rich, or heartbreakingly poor. But when things have been going well for a couple of centuries in a civilization, we begin to find the middle class, and this is exactly what was happening at the time of Hekanacht. In fact, Hekanacht probably saw this change happening during the course of his life, because he was born in very violent times, when the 10th and 11th dynasties were fighting for supremacy in Egypt, and it was a constant state of war and nowhere was safe. But around the time when Hekanacht was a teenager, the 12th dynasty took control of Egypt and they brought an era of peace and prosperity. This is most likely when Hekanacht was able to somehow learn how to read and write. And it was this education which changed the lives of Hekanacht and his family. Because Hekanacht introduces himself as a ka servant. We don't, know ex we don't know exactly what that means, but he was some kind of priest. And back then, being a priest was the equivalent of like having been to college, of being an engineer or something like that. And so with this job, he was with this education, he was able to get a job at a temple. And historians suspect that most of the lands he mentions in the letter were granted to him as a payment for his job at the temple. Also, by being a priest at the temple, he had a job whose salary did not depend on the river, like the salaries of his family and his employees. And this is probably one of the reasons he was able to support them when, with, when they had these bad crops. And that's probably the reason that they did, not, they did not have hunger when so many other people were struggling. Also, I think that we underappreciate writing as a technology because it allowed Hinakacht to be involved in the lives of his family, even if he was far away. It also allowed him to administrate the property he owned in different towns. It also allowed him to keep records of his finances, which he used to take the decision to lower everyone's salaries. Without those records, without the insight he got from that data, he probably would not have been able to take the right decision. And I find all of that oddly beautiful. Of course, there's a lot more evidence of the creation of the middle class in this period of time. For example, there are tombs for individuals with many different levels of wealth, from being very rich to very poor and everywhere in between. There are also monuments which are financed by artisan guilds or by people without titles in their names. And yeah, all of these points that a lot of people were succeeding in becoming moderately wealthy without descending from rich and powerful families. Also, apparently, ancient Egyptians used to greet each other by saying, life, prosperity, health, which is a very neat detail that I didn't know where else to put in the video. And that said, that's what we know about Hekanacht and his family in ancient Egypt. If you like this video, you better subscribe because you know I'm going to be making a lot more of these videos. In fact, here's the list. Check it out and please tell me in the comments which one you want me to do next. Or if you have an ex uh, another example like these ones, uh, please also let me know in the comments. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. And as always, thank you to my Patreons, Otimo Tiosum, Matt Zweig, Daniel H. McGillivray, Marlo Brown, and Valerie Hyde. All my Patreons, thanks a thousand times, thanks a million times.